Earlier, we considered the clinical importance of variation in human anatomy, but physiology is even more variable. Physiology varies with sex, age, diet, weight, physical activity, the external environment. So many things affect the physiological variation. Failure to consider these variation leads to medical mistakes, such as over-medicating the elderly who have lower rates of metabolism, or medicating women based on research that was done in men. So the typical physiological values, like those that will be referenced in a textbook, are based on the reference man and the reference woman. The reference man is a 22-year-old. He's about 154 pounds. He does light physical activity and consumes about 2,800 kcals per day. The reference woman is the same as a man, except she weighs 128 pounds and consumes about 2,000 kcals per day. So the human body has a remarkable ca capacity for self-restoration to maintain things in homeostasis. There's a couple of key figures that come into play in discovering and coining the terminology behind homeostasis. Hippocrates was actually the first to state that the body usually returns to a state of equilibrium by itself. People recover from most illnesses even without the help of any external forces. Homeostasis is the body's ability to de detect change, activate mechanisms that oppose it, and thereby maintain a relatively stable internal condition. Claude Bernard observed that the internal conditions of the body remain quite consistent even when the external conditions have a lot of variance. For example, when it's very cold outside or when it's very hot outside, the body temperature range is still between 97 and 99 degrees despite the great variation. An American physiologist named Walter Cannon coined the term homeostasis for this tendency to maintain internal stability regardless of the external environment. Physiology is basically a large group of mechanisms for maintaining homeostasis. When we lose homeostatic control, we see the onset of illness and death if homeostasis is not restored. So then how is homeostasis maintained? That's where we come into a discussion of negative feedback loops. The temperature of the human body, as noted earlier, doesn't stay at exactly the same place. There's always some variance. This variance is called dynamic equilibrium. Room temperature works in a very similar way if we have a thermostat set to control it. It's not always exactly at 68 degrees. It oscillates around 68 degrees. As room temperature falls, the thermostat will detect the change and activate the furnace. The furnace will put out heat and the room temperature will rise, maybe up to about 70 degrees, at which point the thermostat will shut off the furnace and the room will cool down. This is the perfect example of a negative feedback loop. Again, if the room were to become too cool, then the thermostat will detect that cooling at about 66 degrees, turn on the furnace, which will increase the heat, raise it to about 70. So we see an oscillation of room temperature between 66 and 70 degrees, when the set point is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Now in humans, our body temperature set point is at 98.6 degrees. However, it oscillates around that in a state of dynamic equilibrium. In human thermoregulation, we're going to see it working very similarly to the thermostat and the furnace in your house. The brain will sense changes in blood temperature. If it's too warm, the vessels in the skin will dilate 
and that'll bring heat to the surface, and sweating may begin in order to lose water, thus conducting more heat away from the body. If it becomes too cold, the brain sends messages to vessels in the skin to constrict, and then shivering begins, which is a heat-gaining mechanism. Blood pressure is also under negative feedback control. When we sit up in bed first thing in the morning, it causes a drop in blood pressure in the head and the upper thorax. Baroreceptors, or pressure receptors in the arteries near the heart, alert the cardiac center and the brainstem. The cardiac center sends nerve signals that increase heart rate and return the blood pressure to normal. Failure of this feedback loop may produce dizziness in the elderly. This figure illustrates that sequence of events. Here, the person rises from bed, blood drains from the upper body, creating some imbalance. Baroreceptors, located here and here, respond to the drop in blood pressure, sending a message to the brain, which accelerates the heart rate so that we can increase the blood pressure and put blood back into the upper extremities. There are three components in a feedback loop. There's the receptor, which senses changes. There's the control center, or the integrating center. This is usually the brain. It processes the sensory information and makes a decision that directs the response. The effector is what the control center will signal to carry out the final corrective action and restore homeostasis. Any negative feedback system will have all three components. Take a moment here, close your book, and diagram the negative feedback loop that controls body temperature in humans. I'll often pause and ask you to diagram. Many of these diagrams will be diagrams that are assigned to you to turn in, so it's well worth stopping while the information is fresh, seeing what you can put together. It doesn't matter if you get it right the first time. Again, the point here is to challenge your brain to recall what we've just learned. Any gaps that are missing? That's fine. Turn to your notes, seek out the details, and put them into your diagram. You can even use the figures in the text to cheat in building your own diagram. But these diagramming exercises will really help you understand the physiological mechanisms at play. So if there are negative feedback loops, then surely there are positive feedback loops. Now, a negative feedback loop kept things in check, held things right around the set point. Positive feedback brings things away from the set point. It's a self-amplifying cycle. There are only a very few of these as examples in human physiology. But they lead to a greater change in the same direction. So more of something causes the production of more of that thing. A couple of the situations that we'll see a positive feedback loop in physiology are during childbirth or blood clotting, protein digestion with fever, and then generation of nerve signals. Now childbirth is probably the best example. Now in childbirth, the head of the fetus is going to push against the cervix of the uterus. This pressure against the cervix of the uterus causes a signal of nerve impulses to be transmitted to the brain. The brain then stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. And oxytocin is a hormone involved in contraction. So oxytocin stimulates uterine contractions and pushes the fetus's head towards the cervix which of course creates greater pressure on the cervix and thus greater stimulation to the brain and thus a greater release of oxytocin. So this positive feedback loop during labor creates higher and higher levels of oxytocin and thus higher and higher levels of contractions of the uterus. Eventually, the baby exits the uterus. There's no more pressure on the cervix. We have a major event that prevents the positive feedback loop from continuing. 
We'll see examples of this later in the semester when we look at blood clotting, next semester with protein digestion, next semester with fever and immune response, and again, generation of nerve signals. We'll see that this semester. Let's take a brief look at the harmful effects of a positive feedback loop. Fever is a great example. If the fever gets over 104 degrees Fahrenheit, our metabolic rate is going to be increased, which produces heat even faster. The body temperature continues to rise, which further increases metabolic rate. This cycle continues to reinforce itself and generate higher and higher temperatures. This feedback loop is harmful because after 113 degrees, the body systems start to shut down and it becomes fatal. This is why when temperatures get up above 106, very strict measures are taken to control the situation in emergency medical treatment. So one of the greatest challenges that anatomy and physiology students face is the vocabulary. You run into big crazy words such as corpus callosum or ligamentum arteriosum, extensor carpi radialis longus. You may wonder why these structures aren't just simply named in English and how you'll ever remember such formidable names. Hopefully, I'll be able to demystify that for you a little here. Let's go back to 1895. It used to be that many structures were named with different names in different countries and similar structures were given similar names and some structures were named after people or eponyms. In 1895, the Nomina Anatomica rejected all eponyms and each structure was given a unique Latin name that was to be used worldwide. Turns out now that 90% of medical terms come from only about 1,200 Greek and Latin roots. If we understand a lot of these roots, we'll see them coming up over and over and over again. So really, it makes it a lot more simple to understand. You can run into a lot of these roots in the very back of our textbook. There's a section called Lexicon of Biomedical Word Elements. Browse through there. Check out some of those. See if you can familiarize yourself with a few. They're going to come up over and over throughout the next two semesters. Scientific terms are typically composed of one or more of the following elements. At least one root or stem that bears the core meaning of the word. In cardiology, for example, the root is cardi, which always means heart. Many words have two or more roots. In cardiomyopathy, for example, the roots are both cardi for heart and myo for muscle and path for disease. Often, the words involve combining vowels that are inserted to join roots and make the word easier to pronounce. In cardiomyopathy, each O is a combining vowel. Although the O is the most common combining vowel, all vowels of the alphabet are used in this way, such as A in ligament and E in vitreous, I in fusiform. We also may see prefixes that modifies the core meaning of the root word. For example, gastric pertaining to the stomach or the belly of a muscle takes on a variety of new meanings when prefixes are added like epigastric means above the stomach, hypogastric below the stomach, endogastric within the stomach, and digastric is a muscle with two bellies. A suffix could also be added to the end of the word to modify its core meaning. For example, microscope microscopy, microscopic, and microscopist have different meanings because of their suffixes alone. To summarize these basic principles, consider the word gastroenterology. It's a branch of medicine that deals with the stomach and small intestine. It breaks down into gastro, entero, and logi. Gastro is a combining form meaning stomach, 
entero is a combining form that means small intestine, and logi is the study of. So this is the study of the stomach and the small intestine. Some words are formed from acronyms, or the first few letters of a series of words. Calmodulin, for example, comes from the phrase calcium modulating protein. IN will always infer a protein. So calmodulin is a protein that modulates calcium. This is a useful table from your textbook. Spend some time and familiarize yourself with singular and plural endings. There will also be plural, adjectival, and possessive forms. Plural forms are not always easy. Ovary, ovaries, cortex, cortices, corpus, corpora, epididymis, and epididymis. This just might take some time to get used to. The adjectival form of the same word, brachium, denotes arm, brachii, denotes of the arm. Digits, or the fingers and toes, digiti is a single finger or toe, and digitorum of mon multiple fingers and toes. There's, here are three examples of positive, comparative, and superlative degrees of comparison. In English, we'll see large, larger, and largest. In Latin, these words become magnus, which means large, major, which means larger of two, while maximus is the largest of the three being compares. Adjectives will often follow a noun in a name, foramen magnum, or pectoralis major. <coughs> It's incredibly important that we be precise with our terms. Spelling counts in anatomy and physiology because slight mistakes in spelling could infer a completely different meaning. It may seem trivial to misspell trapezius as trapezium, but in doing so, you're changing the name of a back muscle to the name of a wrist bone. Similarly, changing occipitalis to occipital or zygomaticus to zygomatic changes other muscle names into bone names. Even a little error, such as misspelling ileum, I-L-E-U-M, as I-L-I-U-M, changes the name of the final portion of the small intestine to the name of a hip bone. Changing malleus to malleolus changes the name of a middle ear bone to the name of a bony protuberance in your ankle. The health profession demands utmost attention to detail and precision. People's lives will be in your hands. So now you can see how important it is to spell things absolutely correctly. So take a moment here and look through the directory of lexicon in the back of your book. Put together some of these terms, browse through the plural and singular endings, and just give yourself a little bit of familiarization. In the next section, we'll investigate Atlas A, where we'll explore general anatomical terminology so that we can discuss the various body positions. See you there soon.